this morning from, from, from Dallas. So again, we want to thank here and, and of course be able to thank all of our friends for being able to be here. And we know that you've traveled across several different time zones, but we're so thankful that you've been able to be here and be able to, to stay engaged with us. So again, thank you for that. And also we have some of our homegrown folks that have, have, have been around for a while. I'm going to pick on Miss Beverly Felton over there in the back. I'm not going to look at her as well because all of the, the continued dedication that some of our healthcare providers have, have had and, and had to be able to wear many hats. You know, and as we were coming out of COVID, you know, a lot of our folks, and as we continue to, to come out of COVID, we know that a lot of our folks have, were busy. In addition to their daily staff, their daily duties, they're having to stop and be able to take care of their own communities. So again, we're so thankful for all of our folks that have been able to be engaged because we know that this is a, a, a very tough field to be able to continue to do the work that you are in, in regards to public health, but then, of, but then of course going home and still being a mom, being a father, being a grandparent. So again, we're so thankful for everyone for being able to, to be engaged in that. And also some of our other folks that I've been able to meet, there was a gentleman that I was in line with at Smashburger yesterday because I had to get me one more Smashburger. And he was from Phoenix and being able to talk a little bit about how important it was for him to be here and, and all of the, the great things that are going on and being able to just learn from each other. So, so, so again, I know we've all come from very different backgrounds, but I'm very thankful we've been able to come together and be able to, to uh, share some time. So again, I, I just wanted to thank everybody for making your, making your way out and, and not only being here, but being engaged, being able to continue to uh, be able to be a advocate for your communities. Again, I'm gonna go back to something that Dr. Evan Adams was talking about was being able to be here and, and be able to keep going. And I know in our, in, in our line of work, we're always busy. There's always something that we're focusing on, but I know that we have so many great people that have sacrificed your time to be here, to be able to be engaged, to be able to learn about some of, of the best practices, some of those lessons learned, be able to meet with some of your other folks that maybe you only see in person, but, but you were able to, you took that, you, you made that sacrifice to take time out of your daily lives, be away from your patients, like our doctor, being able to be here and, and be able to, to con, con, continue to be engaged. So again, we're, we're so very thankful for that. And Again, I, I, I want to give a special shout out to everybody that walked from the Sky Room over here and back. And I know it's a, a very heavy walk. I think I've been through three pairs of shoes and my feet still hurt. But again, thank you guys for being here. But enough about me. We have a couple of raffles. So if you can find your raffle tickets, we got some blue raffle tickets that we're using this morning. I had talked to Aaron. Aaron is, is the boss lady when it comes to raffle and making sure that we have and everything. She's like, don't forget to give away those raffles. Make sure that you're doing everything right. And Aaron, I do apologize because I know I can't do anything right, but I'm gonna try. So we're gonna do two raffles this morning before the native chef. And then afterwards, we're gonna do two more raffles. And also a general reminder that during our, our sessions this afternoon are during our, our gratitude ceremony. We will be doing some more raffles. We have some really great things that we will be providing. But this morning, we're going to do two raffles. The first one is going to be for our self-care package, which we have a few things here. Um, again, as, as, as we, we, we've learned, you know, I'm very big on self-care as, as well as Southern Plains to make sure that we're able to take care of ourselves. Because of course, we know that if things aren't ready at home, if things aren't, aren't good at home, then things are going to transition onto work and you're not going to be able to do the best work that you can. So again, we want to make sure that, you know, we're, we're able to take care of our folks. So if you've, if you've reached through your pockets and you, you finally found your ticket like me, I have mine here. Here is our, our, our first winner. Blue ticket, again, 509-7493. 509-7493. Anybody? Anybody? Five zero, five zero nine seven four nine three. Second call, second call. Five zero nine seven four nine three. If you're still, if you're walking in right now, be sure and check your ticket. Chicken, check your ticket. <laughs> Sorry guys, it's lunchtime for me. Um, and, but also we have our, our chef over here. Everything looks looks really amazing. We had a chance to catch up with her a little bit. But uh, second call five zero nine seven four nine three. Last call, 5097. They, sh they should have given them to you whenever you walked in. 
You didn't have one either? Okay, so this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna go ahead and finish this one right here, but then if you, before our next one, we'll, you, if you wanna raise your hand, and we'll make sure that we can get, get you for the next one. So we're gonna go ahead and put, uh, last call, it's closed. Here's our next number here, 509-7348. No, these are these tickets are just from today. These tickets are from this morning. So again, it's a blue ticket, 509-7348. Second call. Second call, probably still probably still walking over. Uh, third call, third call, 509. All right, and we'll close. Let's go to our next one. All right, this is a winner here. I know it. 5097478. I hear some people saying, oh, it's not me. Dang. I know, man. We're gonna have to have a, a dance off then for some of these things. We're gonna have to see who can do the best. See, break out some of other skills. I had a chance to watch uh, some of the potato dance last night. I don't know if you guys got to, got to see some of that. Seen some of those folks breaking it down. That was a, a really fun experience to see. Second call: five zero nine seven four seven eight. And it's closed. Let's go to our next number. 5097431. 5097431. I know. All right. So how about this? Just to, to keep up with the uh, with for for time, so we're not taking away from some of our native chefs over here. I know we had some birthdays. If if today's your birthday, raise your hand. I know we had a couple of people. One birthday, all right here, awesome. Well, we have a gift for you. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here on your on your your twenty first birthday. What's your name and where are you from? Rick, thank you so much for being here, Rick. Thank you for being able to be here and being able to attend and um, being able to participate. So we're very thankful for that. And then for our next one, let's do this. I know we have some folks from Alaska. We have anyone else that's far, farther away from Alaska. If you're from Alaska, raise your hand. We got one from Alaska right here. All right, we got you right here, perfect. Thank you so much for being able to attend this morning and being engaged in day three. And I know you have a long travel home. So again, thank you so much for being here. Larita from Kodiak, Alaska. Thank you so much for being here. I have a thousand questions for our folks from Alaska, but I can save those for, for another time. All right, up next, I want to actually introduce our native chef. As we've, we've continued on throughout the whole week, we're going to finish strong with an amazing chef that I had a chance to, to, to be able to follow with this morning. I want to introduce Chef Nico Albert. Uh, chef Albert is a member of the Cherokee Nation. She's a chef, a caterer, and a student of traditional indigenous, indigenous cuisines based out of Tulsa, Oklahoma. Chef Nico is the executive chef behind the catering services offered by the Burning Cedar Sovereign Kitchen. Her work centers off the revitalization of ancestral indigenous food ways to promote healing and wellness in the Native American communities. Ladies and gentlemen, Chef Nico Albert. Thank you. What up? Thank you, everyone. I'm so happy to be here today. I've really been enjoying everything I've been learning and everyone I've been meeting so far being here. So it's my pleasure uh, to be able to share a little bit of what I know uh, with you this morning. Um, 
I'll tell you right off the bat, I have a presentation for you. A lot of, uh, like the first half of the presentation is probably, uh, you know, I give a lot of presentations to folks that don't necessarily know as much as I know the people in this room do. So we're gonna breeze through a few of these slides because it's stuff that I know you guys already know. We already know, uh, you know, where we came from. We know our own history. Uh, that's part of the work that all of you do. Uh, but it's good to put it in context as we're talking about indigenous foods to remember why it's so important for us to reconnect to these foods. So I'll go ahead and, and just get started. You know, uh, our philosophy with Burning Cedar Indigenous Foods, Burning Cedar Sovereign Wellness is our nonprofit organization now, is that food is our medicine. And a lot of people, even from our own communities, don't have a full understanding about what indigenous food is. And I will get into the reasons why we might not understand what our own foods are. But when I'm talking about indigenous food, I'm talking about our ancestral foods, our original traditional foods that our ancestors ate before colonization. So these foods were in rhythm with the seasons, closely tied to specific regions and highly varied from place to place across Turtle Island. So everybody was accessing foods that were very specific to their place. They had employed sophisticated regenerative agriculture and land stewardship practices, very highly diverse foods, largely plant-based, with meat being more of a seasoning than a main dish, the way we eat today. And all parts of the animal and plants were used with respect. Nothing was wasted. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about indigenous foods, things that were foraged, things we hunted, things we fished for, and things that we cultivated. So there's a good uh, uh, you know, variety of foods that are just the tip of the iceberg of indigenous foods right there on the screen. And that's a beautiful collage that's gonna make everybody hungry as lunchtime comes up here. There's archeological evidence of a robust food system that goes back 10,000 to 14,000 years. So we're talking about fishery management sites. We're talking about cultivating wild plants into plants that we can rely on and that we can plant and harvest with the seasons as we plant them. You know, it was ordinary back then to live beyond 100 years old. Our ancestors were extremely healthy, and a lot of that was because of diet. Because as we're saying, food is our medicine. Our diet was so diverse that we're getting ingredients, we're getting nutrients, micronutrients, all of these different, you know, things that our bodies need from a variety of different sources rather than the, you know, 12 to 13 vegetables that are at the grocery store today. For time context, at the time that our ancestors are drying berries, have these sophisticated food systems, <clears throat> excuse me, food systems of storage, food systems of cultivation, at this time, the civilizations of Rome and Athens that are now seen as just so advanced and so revolutionary, right? They weren't even thought of at this time, but our ancestors already had these very sophisticated systems that worked with our our environment to provide foods for ourselves that were extremely healthy and kept us healthy. So we had these traditional food systems nourishing our communities for millennia, and then these food systems were transformed in the span of a matter of decades with the onset of settler colonialism. So that's where we see, as we know, a tragic amount of land access lost. So this, you know, little model is something I like to show, especially for the non-native population. I showed this, you know, to some folks one time and the jaws were just on the floor because when you see it in an animation like this, to really put into context the amount of land that we had access to versus within less than, you know, 100 years, the amount of land that we ended up with access to, it really shows where our access to food went in such a quick amount of time. So this is kind of a timeline of the disruption of our indigenous food system, starting with doctrine of, uh, doctrine of discovery, which the Pope was so kind as to, I don't remember the word, what is it? He basically said, oops, my bad. <laughs> um, thanks for that, uh, 500 years later. But um, 
starting there and then heading all the way into where we are today, still in the 50s and 60s with the Indian Adoption Project, taking our children away from traditional food sources. So once we were removed from those traditional food sources, once all of that land is taken away, we have to get our food from somewhere. And so that's where we end up relying on commodity food sources. And this, as we saw, you know, this happened within a hundred years, you know, a couple hundred years. So it's a very quick and drastic change in the way that our bodies were metabolizing our food, the way and the places that our nutrients came from. These foods right here, as we'll get into, don't have the same nutrients that our ancestors got from the land. This is just a fun little specific example of, of what these commodity foods were. In an 1832 treaty between the Sac and Fox tribes and the government unironically praised the U.S.'s generosity in its provision of rations. The U.S., besides the presence delivered at the signing of this treaty, wishing to give a striking evidence of their mercy and liberality, mercy, that's awesome, um, will immediately cause to be issued the said confederated tribes, principally for the use of Sac and Fox women and children whose husbands, fathers, and brothers have been killed in the late war, and generally for the use of the whole confederated tribes, articles of subsistence as follows. 35 beef cattle, 12 bushels of, bushels of salt, 30 barrels of pork, 50 barrels of flour, and caused to be delivered for the same purposes in the month of April next at the mouth of the Lower Iowa, 6,000 bushels of maize or Indian corn. So they are talking about articles of subsistence. Articles of, subsist of subsistence are specifically categorized as foods that will barely keep you alive. We're talking about just beef, salt, flour, and corn. These foods are not nutrient dense. These foods are not meant for us to thrive. They're meant as subsistence, bare subsistence. So this is a trauma that happened to our people that exists in our bodies today. This is the generational trauma that we talk about that we are trying to heal. How do we heal that trauma that exists deep within ourselves and that is ongoing today because we still don't have access to those traditional foods. We're still not eating the way our ancestors did and getting all of those nutrients. How do we heal from that? Our ancestors left us the seeds and the stories that tell us how to heal from that. So that's the work that I focus on is how do we reconnect with the way our ancestors ate in order to heal our bodies, heal our mental health, heal our emotional health and hear, heal our spir spiritual health. So that brings me to a story. Uh, this is one of my favorite stories from our Cherokee ways of knowing of the origin of plant medicine. And this is a great example of the information that our ancestors left us so that we can make our way back to an understanding of a relationship with the natural world that will restore our health and wellness. So the story starts at, as most of our Cherokee stories start, a long time ago at the very beginning of things when all of the plants and animals and people all lived together and spoke the same language. And for a long time we lived in this balance that we call Dohi. In Cherokee society, Tohi is our concept of wellness. And I know that there are parallels in a lot of different indigenous societies. Um, you know, Chef Nephi Craig even talked about, um, and I apologize if I pronounce this a little wrong, but Gojo, another concept that is very similar to our concept of Tohi, which is wellness, but we're not talking about just the absence of disease. We're not talking about just our physical state. Today, the way that we look at medicine, we're thinking of wellness from a Western perspective, from a European perspective that says that, you know, we're looking at diseases, we're looking at symptoms, and we're trying to get rid of those symptoms. But in indigenous ways of knowing, there is a much deeper understanding of what wellness truly is. So. For the Cherokee, health is more than the absence of disease. It includes a fully confident state 
of a sense of a smooth life, peaceful existence, unhurried pace, and easy flow of time. The natural state of the world is to be neutral, balanced, with a similarly gently flowing pattern. All aspects, physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual, that medicine wheel that we go back to at all times when we're trying to get our way back to health and wellness, those all figure into the concept for Cherokees of good health. So I love an analogy that I was told when understanding Thohi, Though he is like the easy pace that clouds move across the sky. They're going at exactly the pace that they're meant to go in that moment. Sometimes life is going as fast as a, a, a hunter running through the forest after his prey. Sometimes life is going as fast as an elder making their way slowly to the dinner buffet, you know? But each person is moving at exactly the same pace that they're supposed to be moving at. That's wellness, is a peaceful forward motion and all things in balance and in good relationship. So at the beginning in our story, we have this balance, but what happens with humans is we often tend to forget our place in that balance. And so at this time, humans started to forget that balance with the animals that they were receiving gifts from. They started to hunt animals for sport, hunt them for trophies, and waste the gifts that the animals gave them. And the animals were understandably very upset by this. And so they went to Creator, the animals called their council, went to Creator and said, something must be done to stop these humans from from taking all of our gifts without giving anything in return. It's not fair, it's not balanced, and we won't survive as long as the humans are treating us this way. And so Creator agreed, and the solution was to send down all of these diseases. Now, before this point, humans had never had so much as a headache or common cold. Now we were suffering from all sorts of things, like chronic illnesses, cancer, arthritis, different things that we suffered from, and there was no cure for these ailments that were afflicting the human beings. And after a while, the plants started to see the human suffering and realize that this was not balance either. This was not the tohi that is needed for wellness in the world. And so the plants, in their compassionate way, said to Creator that they wanted to help. Creator then gave the gift of medicine to each plant. So each plant was given the gift of a medicine that would cure something that ailed the human beings. But the caveat is this, we can't just run out into a field and pick anything and eat it and feel better from whatever is ailing us. We have to be in a good relationship with the plants to be able to receive gifts from them because that's what a relationship is. That's what a gift is. It creates a relationship. So. The plants giving us this gift of medicine, we have to know and be in a relationship with those plants to receive the gift. So when you think about people that you have a relationship with, you know these things about those people. You know where they live. You know who their family is. You know who their friends are. You know who they don't get along with. You know what kind of conditions they like. Do they like a sunny day or do they prefer those cloudy, rainy days? What's their favorite time of year? What do they like to eat? What makes them feel good? You know these things about your family and your friends because you have a relationship with them. Well, what we're talking about here is having that relationship with plants because those plants have gifts to give us, the medicine that heals things in our bodies. We can have this same relationship with plants that we do with our family members and our friends. These are all things that we can and should know about the plants that have the ability to heal us. When we understand where to find the plants that we need, what gifts those plants have to give, what time of year is best to ask for those gifts, then we're in a good relationship. And a relationship also involves caring for the plants themselves. So from the viewpoint of the private property economy, the gift is deemed to be free right? When we're talking about the capitalist economy that we live in generally here, a gift is something that's given to you for free. But from an indigenous perspective, in a gift economy, gifts are not free. The essence of the gift is that it creates a set of relationships. The currency of a gift economy is, at its root, reciprocity. So in Western thinking, private land is understood to be a, a bundle of rights, 
in the gift economy, from an indigenous way of knowing, a gift is a bundle of responsibilities. So we have a responsibility to those plants. We have a responsibility to those animals. And when we take care of them, they can take care of us. And that is thohi, that's wellness. That's the balance that we're looking for. So what are some of these gifts that our plant teachers can give us? The physical nourishment in the form of nutrition. We know that fruits and vegetables are good for us, that whole grains are better for us, that processed foods are things that we need to get away from because they don't have concentrations of these nutrients that we need. The nutrients that we need are found in plants. We also get mental health support. There are micronutrients in all of these plants that we need to be eating that are vital to healthy brain function. We get pride in our identity as indigenous people. So this is a benefit that is both spiritual and emotional and mental. The pride that we get, our ancestors were climate scientists, biotechnologists, botanists, dietitians, nutritionists, and all of these foods that they were able to develop and refine and develop these relationships with, they feed the world now. Again, back to what Chef Nephi, if you, if you saw his presentation, he was talking about when you go into the grocery store and you see all of these foods on the shelves, you know, think about a plate of French fries and ketchup. We would not have that if it weren't for our ancestors because that's the tomatoes that they cultivated from wild plants. That's potatoes that they cultivated from wild roots. Those things, while not the healthiest for us today, those things still have their roots in indigenous ways of knowing, and that's a sense of pride. Connection to the past and future generations come through our ancestral seeds, and these lessons that we get through stories about our plant relatives and our interaction, they teach us about our interaction with one another, and they have parallels in the natural world. So what we need to find out is how we can eat like our ancestors in order to heal because the evidence is there that all of the diversity of diet that our ancestors had is the key to living healthy, longer, happier lives that are more in tune with our environment. So one of those things is tune into the seasons. Eating seasonally is a big part of eating like our ancestors. We also need to diversify that diet. As I've said, the handful of of vegetables that we have access to in most of our grocery stores today don't provide that, that, that breadth of nutrition that our ancestors had access to. So finding ways to incorporate more diversity into our diets is key. And eating more plants. That's, you know, a plant-based diet is one of the ways to really tap into that way of knowing that will lead to health buying whole foods and buying simple foods. So the recipe that I'm gonna show you today all uses whole ingredients. That's the main thing that we're trying to get back to is away from those processed foods, away from things that have you know, 15 different ingredients, half of which we can't pronounce, that are chemicals, that are produced in factories. We want to, you, to buy and eat foods that are as close to the way they came out of the ground as possible. And that's just the guideline that we, can, that we can bring back to our communities when you're shopping at the grocery store is how many ingredients are there on the label? You want as few as possible and you want them as close to the way that they were created as possible. And then another really important thing is getting outside, going for a walk and foraging. Now, we don't live in the same world that our ancestors lived in. And that's a fact that we just have to deal with. There's no way that we are going to get out there and that we can even you know, remotely encourage our communities to say you should somehow provide everything that you need for your family just by foraging. We don't have access to land for that. We saw that in the map. We know that from living in urban communities that we don't have access to land to go foraging the way that our ancestors did. And the land is not the same as it was when our ancestors lived on it either. The land has, has been developed to the point that we don't have access to all of those plants anymore. But the connection that you make from connecting to the land, even going on a walk and not actually harvesting anything, just identifying things on a foraging walk is a way to heal 
and to incorporate our ancestors' teaching and our ways of knowing into our lives, and that leads to wellness. It doesn't have everything to do with the calories you're taking in, with the nutrition, the micronutrients. Some of it is that emotional, spiritual, and mental connection that we make to the land through foraging that heals us. And the dish that I'm going to share today also has a lot of really great ingredients that I've foraged from the springtime that we can celebrate the seasons and be more in tune with what's happening on our planet. That is a way of wellness. The other way is gardening. Gardening, and this is a quote from my friend Linda Black Elk, who if you don't follow her on social media, she's incredible and she's an ethnobotanist who has such a wealth of knowledge and really a lot of great recipes and tips for how to incorporate more diversity into your diets. Gardening is no longer an option for native people or for anyone. It's an essential activity that our ancestors perfected and that we must perpetuate for the survival of our children. So put aside your fears, take a deep breath, and then plant a sacred seed. Give it water and sun and watch it grow. Breathe and remember that gardening is the sweetest act of resistance and resilience. You're planting generations of memories going backwards and forwards. Part of the workshops and the work that we do with Burning Cedar Sovereign Wellness is to encourage a connection to gardening, whether you have, you know, acres of land to plant your own plot and harvest vegetables to sustain you over the year, or maybe you live in an apartment and you have a tiny apartment balcony, you can still reach out, find your ancestral seeds, those seeds that connect us seven generations behind us to our ancestors, plant those seeds and watch them grow and even if we can't harvest, you know, a, a single squash or a single tomato off of that plant, we're still doing that revolutionary act of planting the seeds that our ancestors saved and passed on through generations for us. And we're ensuring that we teach that reverence for life and send it forward with our children. And this is one of my favorite, I guess it's a meme, <laughs> what gives people feelings of power? Is it money? Is it status? Or is it growing a tomato? I've felt that feeling, even if I'm not, you know, our corn patch, the, like a couple years ago, we planted our, my ancestral uh, Cherokee white eagle corn. And I harvested enough corn for one batch of soup to feed our family of four. And it took six months, it was very difficult, and it was one, basically four bowls of soup. But the power and the connection that I felt harvesting and drying that corn and saving it for a special occasion to cook and share it with my family, that was a healing that I could never put a feeling of money or status on. It was something much deeper, older, more important and it healed me in a way that kept me going, kept me wanting to plant more seeds. And that's the wellness that we're looking for. We want to think about cooking as ceremony. So ceremony, you know, sometimes we think of ceremony as dances that we go to at certain times of the year or things that we do, you know, when people are sick or we get together to pray when we need something or when we want to celebrate something. But ceremony has the power to make mundane things sacred. So even the ceremony behind cooking your lunch for yourself in the afternoon or, you know, cooking a meal for your family, cooking Sunday dinner, that can be ceremony it matters with the intention that we cook with. So gratitude and reverence for our ingredients. When we cook, we don't waste bits of what we're using. We save the ends of our onions, we save the peels of our carrots, we save the butts of our celery and we save those to make stock so that nothing that that plant put their whole life into growing goes to waste. That is ceremony. Making sure that we put good intention as we are cooking those foods. Thinking about who's going to receive the food that we're making and how we want it to make them feel. That is ceremony. 
all of those things put into the act of creating a meal for someone, even if that someone is just yourself, can be ceremony and should be ceremony. I'm reminded of um, uh, my mother-in-law, my husband's mother, told me a story of the way that she grew up. She's from the um, White Eagle Reservation in Oklahoma. And she told me about how in the way that their home was set up, they had the home where they all stayed, where you know their beds were and everything like that, but the cookhouse was completely separate because that was a place, not just you know where it gets hot and you don't want it where you're sitting, you know, it's, it wasn't for reasons of you know, semantics like that. It was because cooking was ceremony and it was done in this special place. And so every meal felt that way. Imagine how we would feel Imagine the healing we could get from every meal if we thought of every meal we were cooking that way. So when we create a world in which Native people are seen, heard, and respected as equals, where their purpose and con contributions to society are acknowledged and celebrated, where society values the vast knowledge systems that supported Native communities for thousands of years and invests in that system wholeheartedly, we can begin to heal. Indigenous perspectives on wellness and ecology are the key to a healthy and sustainable future for our world. What we're talking about here is we all know the concept of seven generations. Our ancestors laid the pathway for us seven generations before. They sent stories with us. They left seeds for us. They developed all of these ways of cultivating and foraging and hunting food that lead to a healthy and full life and that in reciprocity heal the earth as, as we heal ourselves. Those ways are ways that can help the entire world. Those aren't just for us, they're for our, our community at large. So by reconnecting with these foods and teaching them to our communities, we are ensuring that future generations will be able to take advantage of those. So part of what we talk about at Burning Cedar Sovereign Wellness is our, our motto, our, you know, our mantra is gather, heal, and grow. This is something that I would love for you to take back to your communities. What are the ways that we can all gather, heal, and grow? We're gathering together as people, gathering foods from the natural world, healing the natural world along with ourselves, and growing and taking those things into the future with us. Um, so, thank you so much. I'm going to, um, oh, my, my uh, information about the dish that I'm making didn't actually pop up there, but that's okay. I'm going to demo it for you anyway, and we'll just kind of tilt the pans so you guys can see it. Um, so, what I'm making today is a great example of all of those foods that we just talked about, which is we're making a crispy wild onion, dandelion, and sweet potato fritter. It's kind of um, like an elevated, you know, kind of bougie version, a brunch dish, if you will, version of wild onions and eggs. So, I know we've got a lot of southeastern folks around here. I don't know if anybody else has uh, the tradition of eating wild onions and eggs in the spring, but wild onions were, for me, one of the ways that I was first able to connect to my Cherokee community. I grew up in California and moved to Oklahoma in my early 20s. So I grew up away from my community. One of the ways that I found to really connect and feel, um, you know, feel connected to my heritage was through going to wild onion dinners in the springtime. And for those of you who aren't familiar, wild onions, I've got a little example of them here. I even kept the dirt on them for you so you can see how these grow. But this is everywhere in people's lawns. This is all over, even in the herb. I mean, I, I, I dug this up at a park in Tulsa, Oklahoma. So this is something that I love teaching people about as kind of a foray into foraging because it's so easy to identify. It's really difficult to mess up. That's, I think, a big barrier for people is, I don't want to forage because what if I eat the wrong thing and I make myself sick? If it smells like onions and it looks like this, it's onions. <laughs> it could potentially be garlic. The worst thing that's going to happen is you're going to have garlic breath instead of onion breath. It's still edible. It's still healthy for you. 
It's in the allium family. Now, we talked about how plants have medicine for us, right? And they have that medicine exactly when we need it. They have what we need when we need it, if we know how to ask. So this is a perfect example of this because all alliums contain diuretic properties. So the medicine in this is that it flushes out our kidneys, our livers, flushes our whole system out from all of the things that have built up in it. If you think about the way our ancestors lived with the seasons, they're holed up all winter, there's nothing green growing, we're eating a lot of preserved foods, salted foods, smoked foods, mostly dried grains like corn, dried beans, and meat. We're not having a lot of fresh foods. So that builds up toxins in your body. Even if you're eating you know, whole foods straight from the earth, toxins build up in your body. What comes up very first in the springtime? Wild onions and dandelions. Both of these contain tons and tons of that diuretic that flushes our body out. So it makes room in our body for all of the fresh foods that we're going to plant and harvest throughout the summer, all of the fresh things that we'll be able to forest throughout the foraging season. We wouldn't be able to absorb the nutrients from those plants if our bodies are all junked up with preservatives and, and salts and things like that. So the earth gives us exactly what we need when we need it. So I've got these wild onions here. I've chopped them up really fine. I've also picked some dandelion, which is this wonder plant that every single part of the plant is edible. And it's best to get early in the spring because later in the summer it gets very bitter, harder to palate, you know, harder to uh, enjoy. But right now it's got a lot of flavor and so many nutrients. So I'm putting about a quarter cup of chopped up wild onions in here. Same amount, about a quarter cup of my dandelion. And then I'm gonna season with a little bit of cayenne pepper. We want just a little bit of a kick. And then some cumin, a little bit of that. And then about a half a teaspoon of salt. And in my bowl here, I've got one sweet potato shredded up. I didn't show you guys that yet. And I just use my food processors to, to shred this. It takes about 10 seconds. It's really great. If you have one of the old school box shredders, you can do that too. And then you're getting your workout in. Work the shoulder muscles. And so I just mix my seasoning in there. And then I'm going to grab one egg. That's going to bind our mixture together. And then... In the recipe that I gave you guys that's going to be printed in the book, we used cornstarch. I also like using arrowroot powder. Anything like that is going to be a good binder. There's two tablespoons of this just to kind of coat the sweet potato and keep it all together. And then I'm also using uh, masa flour. This flour, and I buy mine from Masienda. I really like this company. They have all different kinds of masa, blue, um, yellow, white masa. This is a red masa from a red ground red corn. Basically, they grow in a sustainable way. It's a family-owned, indigenous-owned company. They grow their ancestral varieties of corn. They process it to make hominy and dry it, and then they grind it themselves. And so this product is fantastic. And I'm going to add that in. And that's going to add just a little bit of like a corn flavor to these. And then we're just going to mix it up. I'm going to grab a glove here so that I don't have to get that everywhere. And you just want to make sure that everything is evenly combined and coated. And it's going to seem a little bit dry at first. And this is why the resting period is important. When you're making something like a fritter like this, you can do this with zucchini. You can do this with regular white or red potatoes and make a potato cake. Sweet potatoes are great for it. You can also use something like butternut squash or pumpkin, anything that you can shred up like this. The mixture is going to be a little bit dry, but as the salt and the seasonings and the juices kind of start coming out of both the sweet potato and the onion and the dandelion that we have in here, we're going to get a nice uniform mixture that will stick together in a patty. See right now, a little crumbly. It's all mixed together, but 
Magic happens when the salt pulls all of the moisture out of everything that we've got in there. So I would sit this in the fridge and let it rest for about 20 minutes. I'm not going to be able to fill talking 20 minutes while we stare at that and wait for it to rest. No one wants to see me do that. So I have some that I made last night. And you can see it, there's actually a lot of water that comes out of this. And this is even, I squeezed my sweet potatoes. I forgot to mention that. Part of uh, getting all of that moisture out of there is you'll put your sweet potatoes or zucchini or pumpkin or whatever you're using in a tea towel like this and wring it out. You can do the same thing with uh, paper towel if you don't have a tea towel like that. But it wrings a lot of the moisture out and you're still going to end up with a lot. So we'll just be able to kind of move our mixture to the side there. And I'm letting my pan heat up. And we're just going to form little patties. And the oil that I'm using for frying here, I'll show that to you guys, is avocado oil. One of my favorite oils to use, mainly because it's got heart healthier fats and it's a byproduct of the avocado industry, so they're not growing avocados just for their pits. It's just an oil derived from the pits that leads to less waste. And so I appreciate that aspect of sustainability. It's pretty easy to get nowadays, Sam's Club, Costco, you know, places like that. But I do want to reiterate something that, again, Chef Nephi mentioned and that I've come to to know and learn through my work with the community. If all you have is canola oil or all you have is vegetable oil that either came in your commods box or that's you know just what you have on hand, it's 100% better that you're making food for yourself. And there's no shame and there's no, you know, it doesn't make it wrong that you're not making the recipe wrong if you are, don't have the means to buy the avocado oil for this. This is the best but there's a sliding scale here. We have to meet people where they're at. And so these recipes are very, you know, malleable. They're very flexible. Put what you have into this, you know. I like using arrowroot powder as a, as a binder. Arrowroot powder is like $6 for a pound, whereas the cornstarch in the recipe that I printed for you guys, you know, that you get at the 99 cent store. So it's important to make sure and take these recipes and adapt them for what you have access to. All right, so my pan is just about there. The way that I test it is pretty much test anything like this. Take just a little bit of your fritter batter, and if it sizzles like that, then you know you're ready to go. So I'm making patties of about three tablespoons, just like this. Squeeze them out a little bit. You don't want to squeeze too hard because then you're going to squeeze a lot of the moisture out. We want a little bit left in there. And just about like half of an inch thick. And we're going to slide that into the oil. This is going to be the base for basically something like an Eggs Benedict. One thing that, uh, you know, I understand why Bernays and Hollandaise sauce are popular. They're full of butter and egg yolks and it's delicious. But I always kind of wondered, you know, if you have that nice soft poached egg that's got all the egg yolk in it, it kind of makes its own sauce. So this is a sauceless Benedict because I've found, you know, we can enjoy the flavor of a good egg and not need all of that butter in there. Really what we want is that creamy sauce on top, right? So the yolk is going to do that for us. So I'm just adding, I think I'll do four at a time here on my pan. And we just want to wait until it's golden brown on one side, and then we'll flip them over and get them golden brown on the other side. And while I do that, I'm going to get my eggs ready. So you can do this with fried eggs if you prefer fried eggs. Being in the restaurant industry for as long as I have, I at some point had to work brunch. Every chef hates brunch. That's the secret that you're finding out today. I'm spilling the beans. The top secret chef... Uh, confession is that every chef hates brunch and we hate brunch because it's sticky <laughs> and because eggs everyone likes their eggs different and it's very complicated and you get those brunch tickets and they're about this long because everyone's got all those modifications but as much as I hate making brunch in restaurants I love eating brunch so there's a trade-off there 
I'm going to show you guys how to poach an egg because poaching by far is the healthiest way to eat your eggs. You know, there's no fat involved. The fried egg, while it's got those delicious crispy edges, does add a little bit of fat when you're frying it in the pan. So poaching eggs is something that I think a lot of people uh, have a little trepidation about because it's kind of tough to get the egg to stay together in the pan. And I'll show you my trick on how I do that as soon as we get these turned over. Perfect. So those are nice and golden brown, crispy on one side. We'll let them get crispy on the other side. And then I'll get my pan going. The first trick for poaching eggs is that you don't want your water boiling or even really simmering. Any kind of bubbling is going to break your egg apart. So I'm going to wait for this to get a little bit hotter. You basically want it to where the the little bubbles, tiny, tiny bubbles, are starting at the very bottom of your pan, and steam is starting to come up. And that's going to be hot enough to get your eggs cooked. And the other trick I have is I put a splash of vinegar in my water. And that kind of helps the egg. It seasons it a little bit and helps the egg to hold together into that really beautiful oval shape that we're looking for. So I'm going to give that water just another minute and pull these fritters out and let them rest. You can do this on a paper towel, paper towel lined plate, or use a tea towel again like I have here. We just want to let them drain a little bit and let that, that oil drain off of it. And we're going to use this same pan to fry up some asparagus to go with it. My mom actually grew this asparagus in her garden, which is why it's so irregular like this. It's the real deal asparagus, not the uniform, you know, factory asparagus that we get at the store. So that's a special treat. I get my oil nice and shimmering hot, and I'm going to use the same pan that I cooked the fritters in. We don't need to dirty any extra dishes here. We're just going to add a little bit to the pan and sprinkle it with a little bit of this sea salt for seasoning. And it really doesn't need much. When it's homegrown, it's got its own delicious flavor. Turn that down a little bit. So my water's to that point where it's got just the bubbles around the edges. Here's the other trick, is cracking your eggs ahead of time and getting a little vortex going in your pan. So I'm stirring my pan, getting the water going into a little bit of a whirlpool. And then, yep. I'm going to add my egg, slide it into the swirling water. And the motion of the water automatically brings that egg together. And that way, you've got your egg all, you know, you don't, you've got a little bit of these feathery pieces that come off, but the majority of the egg is going to stay together right there. So that's. And we'll do a couple more of them here. One more there. Give it one more little swirl and add this last guy. And then those will just take maybe about a minute. And we'll have everything ready to plate here. And all I'm wanting to do, I like, you know, when you cook your asparagus, one of the reasons I think I didn't like asparagus as a kid was that it was always cooked until it was so mushy. I like that asparagus to have a little bit of a bite. So really, we've just got a really hot pan. We're getting a little bit of color on each side of the asparagus. And then we're going to take it out, because that's all it needs. And it's going to continue to cook a little bit, and that kind of steams it the rest of the way. All right. Now I'm breaking my own rules over here because my pan is boiling. I'm going to turn it down a little bit more. Once you've got the eggs in there and they've kind of made their little shape in the pot, it is okay to turn the heat up a little bit. And then we'll plate. Got a little bit of that fritter right here. And then we're going to top it with some pieces of this nice spring asparagus. And this is just 
basically everything that makes me think of spring. We've got spring veggies, spring herbs, and eggs for a perfect little spring breakfast. And the other thing that I brought to talk to you guys about is shrub. And so this is just a little beverage, quick beverage to go along with our brunch here. A shrub is basically a drinking vinegar. So that might sound really terrible at first thought, just drinking vinegar. Um, but vinegar has a lot of uh, really healthy aspects to it especially if you're using like an apple cider vinegar that still has the mother in it. Similar to drinking kombucha, that's a drinking vinegar basically because we're using this vinegar base and I've infused it and I was hoping to get some dandelions to really show you the full aspect of what dandelions have to offer here, but I went out to my lawn this morning and all of my dandelions were gone. So I think somebody had a really good breakfast, but it's not us. Um, so what I've got here is some red bud blossoms, and it's just about a half a cup of red bud blossoms, a half a cup of vinegar, and a half a cup of agave nectar. I like to use agave nectar or honey rather than sugar when making shrubs because it's a more natural sweetener, a little bit of a lower glycemic index, so a little bit better for you. And basically, we've just made a kind of a, a simple drink base that's flavored with the flavor of the red bud, or you can add things like magnolia or dandelion or forsythia earlier in the spring. That's a flower that has a really nice floral aroma. Any kind of edible flower you can infuse into a vinegar like this, add a little bit of sweetener, and you've got a shrub, and that serves as your base. So I can add a little bit of that to just a glass of ice and top it off with some sparkling water and it's going to be a really kind of sweet and tangy, really refreshing drink, but that also has those added benefits of fermentation. So I'll just top these eggs on the dish here and that's our, our healthy brunch with elements of foraged spring medicines. <laughs> So I kind of went over uh, time for questions, but if we do have a couple that came up, I think we've got time to run through those. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much for being able to show everything. And I'm getting a chance to look over here. And we were talking about at, at our table, we're so impressed that you can crack an egg with one hand. <laughs> we, we are not pros at that at all at, at, at my house. <laughs> whenever, I, I, whenever I make eggs, we just enjoy the shell as well because that's just <laughs> one of those so things. So I do have uh, that's, two. That's what brunch will give you, cracking about 500 eggs in the history of my career, I think. <laughs> you, get, you get pretty quick at it. <laughs> I have two, qu two quick questions for you. Sure. Uh, do you work with any mobile, mobile farmer's markets? You know, we have one mobile farmer's market that I know of in Tulsa um, that is kind of gearing up to uh, answer to the food desert issue in our North uh, Tulsa region, and it's called RG Foods. And so I do have a relationship with them. And, you know, we haven't done any events together yet, but I think it's an incredible solution to the problem of food deserts that we have. Mm -hmm. And it's a great way to get these, you know, fresh vegetables, whole foods to people that might only have access to places like Dollar General, Dollar Tree, Family Dollar, all of those places where it's really just processed foods. You can't get whole ingredients there. It brings the whole ingredients to you. So love the mobile grocery store idea. Awesome. Thank you. And I have one more question. I know we're, we're starting to run short on time, but what resources do you recommend for learning about how to forage? Um, social media is one of the greatest resources that we have, honestly. Um, it has its, its highs and lows, of course, but there are people to follow, like Linda Black Elk, who is incredible, who are so open to um, sharing their knowledge and things like that. I also uh, really enjoy, you know, I, I, for those of you that don't know, I did a Hulu uh, chef competition show called Chefs vs. Wild, um, and it was all about foraging, what could we forage, and what kind of, you know, 
basically fancy four course meal could we create out of things we found in the woods. And my opponent on that show was a man named Alan Burgo, who um, is called the Forager Chef, and he has a lot of great books and so much knowledge about foraging, and so I recommend his books as well. And then, really, there are so many different um, groups on Facebook that I'm a part of, and that's where a lot of my knowledge comes from, is from connecting with community, finding out what knowledge has been passed down through their families, and then being able to ask questions, show pictures, hey, I found this, what do you think it is? <laughs> we have a lot of those posts, so um, there's Oklahoma Wild Crafting. If you're in Oklahoma, it's a fantastic group. Um, we have one specifically for Cherokees. Um, hit me up uh, on Facebook, at Burning Cedar Tulsa, or Instagram, at Burning Cedar Tulsa. I can connect you to those pages as well. But um, Oklahoma Wildcrafting is a great one. If you're anywhere in this region, um, there are people in that group that have so much knowledge to share, and it's just a really great way to connect with people that are into the same thing and have um, you know, the same questions as you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Let's give our chef a round of applause. Thank you again, <laughs> Chef Nico Albert. Thank you so much. What up? All right. <laughs> Well, I have been giving the been getting the stairs over here. I know it's lunch time, so we are going to actually take our lunch break. I want to do a, a general reminder that we do have our evaluation, so please, if you can take some time to complete those. And this afternoon, we have our big ending ceremony. As I'm telling you, it's going to be amazing. I hope that you guys are able to to uh, to hang out for that. We will have our seventh generation awards. We have a few other awesome things. So again, thank you guys so much for your time this morning. Please enjoy your day.